question and, ask, and, and answer session on this same topic. So surely all of you decided, whoa, I wanted to hear this presentation so much that you nominated it for one you wanted to hear. So that must mean you've got a question you want to ask. So during the presentation, uh, and you can ask the question during the presentation. That doesn't uh, uh, disrupt me at all. So if there's a question you want to ask and you don't want to wait to the end, that's perfectly okay if you raise your hand. Uh, one of the rules I like to see everybody follow is when you ask a question, please identify yourself, your name and your call sign. Um, and when you formulate your question, sometimes it's helpful to formulate your question so that it's more of general interest rather than very, very focused on your own uh, situation. So if you have a question that instead of asking about your uh, favorite uh, XYZ antenna and its interface to your computer in a particular piece of software you're running, to broaden the question a little bit so it's a little more interest. If you can do that, that's, that's sometimes helpful. If you don't, sometimes I'll do that, and I'll take the liberty to do that. So let's get started. Um, receiving antennas. I've been using separate receive antennas at my station for about 25 years, mostly beverages. And about 10 years ago, Tom, W-H-J-I, uh, has started on, started on his website describing some of his success with short verticals. And I looked at that material, and boy, it sure seemed interesting. And he had some amazing claims about its performance, and he had some very large beverage arrays as well. But I never did anything about it. I was interested, but not interested enough to do anything. And then about four or five years ago, W5ZN, Joel, and N4HY, wrote an excellent paper about short verticals. It's on Joel's website, w5zn.org. And he also had some very detailed descriptions of how well that antenna performed compared to his beverages. And I took even more interest in it, but I didn't do anything until two years ago. And two years ago, I built one of Joel's arrays for 160 meters, and I said, why did you wait so long? The, uh, the performance of Joel's eight-element array, which is, was originally WHJA's design, is, believe me, it's just like using a five-element Yagi on 160. It's that good. The, uh, the, the beam width is about the same as a five-element Yagi, about 45 degrees, and the side lobes are down 20 dB all the way around the compass. It's absolutely amazing. I have no idea why I waited 10 years to do that. But... That antenna takes about an acre, and there are many, oh, speaking about W5ZN, he just walked in the door. <laughs> I was just talking about your, your eight element array. Do you want to come up here and give this presentation? No. <laughs> I do indeed. I do now. Um, so, but we're not going to talk only about the very high end of performance of 160 meter receiving arrays. We're going to talk about the whole range from very small antennas, three foot diameter loop, sometimes called a magnetic loop. And we're going to cover the entire range of possible antennas, all the way up to antennas that to cover a single direction take, two, take 20 acres. And to cover eight directions would take well over 100 acres. We're going to cover the whole range and suggest a few sweet spots of really good performance for small, medium, and large sized pieces of property. So, let's uh, get started. Oh, and the, look at this little punchline here. Uh, I started out with 14 beverages. Next season, I'll probably have two or three, just as uh, supplementary antennas to some of the others. Tim tells me he doesn't have any anymore, and he had about the same, about 14. So, there definitely is something better. A lot better. So why receiving antennas? On the low bands, 160, 80, and even 40, unless you have a really large Yagi array, receiving antennas offer significantly better receiving performance. And for many of us, our transmitting signals are fine, but sometimes we have difficulty listening through pile-ups on the low bands because the signals from the US are so strong and the DX isn't very strong or there are local thunderstorms or who knows what that is getting in the way. 
So receiving antennas are very helpful, and they, they can have amazing performance in small spaces. And if you look at the technical performance requirements for transmitting antennas and receiving antennas, they are different. Stated simply, we care about only one thing for transmitting antennas. We want to be loud. We want to be heard by the other guy at the other end. So for transmitting antennas, to simplify things drastically, we only care about how efficient they are, how much power they can handle, and if they have any gain. That's all we care about. But for receiving antennas, we care about a lot more. We care about how narrow the main lobe is so that we can steer that lobe to the signal we want to hear and away from the signals we don't want to hear. We care about all the side lobes on the receiving antenna so all the noise in QRM is reduced compared to the signal we want to hear. Um, and we might want to build an antenna, a very sophisticated antenna, that is practical to build. Some of these large transmitting arrays on 160 and 80 meters are very difficult to align properly because of a technical characteristic called uh, mutual impedance. If you ever try to build a large transmitting phased array for 160 or 80 meters, you'll have some fun trying to get the elements of that array properly aligned because of the interaction between the elements called mutual impedance. You can, in receiving antennas, you can eliminate that problem so that aligning a receiving antenna is no more difficult than uh, doing a lab bench alignment, not having to do it out in the field. You can eliminate this nasty interaction uh, easily, and I'll show you how to do that later in the presentation. 